Christ almighty. Stop. We've just arrived. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good morning on podcast. Good morning on YouTube. Morning. If you're if you're too busy to watch now, why not listen later on podcast? Well, this is good now. You can do a squat on it. I wouldn't do that. That will get us. That will get oh, us banned child on YouTube. Play. I bet you anything it will. Everything YouTube seems is to. as sensitive as a nun in a garden. Are you going to shout all the way through this? I don't know. I wouldn't spoon and heat. Um. Yeah. Morning, everybody. Hope you're well. Um. So, do you do this as a couple? Do you find that day in, day out, you come, you wear the same colour? We've done it again. Well, black is a pretty ubiquitous no, colour. I don't usually wear black when we're doing this because I think you need a bit of sunshine. A little bit of pink. Well, yeah, I've got a little, a little bit, bit of pink. pink. I've got Chucky's hair. Yeah. Um, big news over the weekend is they're, they're gender they're, they're gender massaging Punch and Judy. What do you think of that? So, it's not, so it's not Punch. So, so there's a sort of... A gender fluidity to it and it's less aggressive. It's not Punch and Judy, then, is it? <laughs> Isn't he called Punch because he punches her? Why don't they say we've got a brand new puppet show? <sighs> I mean, when you think about it, Punch and Judy was pretty. Oh, it was brutal. Outrageous. Brutal. I mean, it really was when you think it lasted as long as it did. Brutal. I mean, I remember seeing a proper Punch and Judy show on the beach in Blackpool. Yeah. And there was blood. Being... Blood would come out in the form of a tissue. Do you remember they hit her in the neck? And... Tissue would You're fly joking. out. It was it was my first experience of horror. Yeah, I, I must say, oh, thanks, I, I know that there is, a, you know, there's a lot that we do find is like ridiculous censoring, and I wouldn't like to think of it censoring Punch and Judy, but just times have moved on. Well, you're not allowed now to call these wooden. Well, you're allowed to call them wooden, but you're not allowed to call them spoons because spooning is an act that you do in bed that's seen as aggressive. You can't call it a spoon. Well, absolutely right, Mark. Stop being too silly because it's annoying. Mm. Oh, Ned. Just do that. Stop it. Now, you've, now you're too much already this morning. Don't because you're going to annoy me. To calm down. Okay. So how many coffees have you had? I've had one. I have so... Right, calm down. I've calmed. Right, do a menu of what's coming up. Just beforehand, Shem, I'm going to say this in the nicest way possible, but don't ask us about the tree again. All right? Your first warning. <laughs> Just don't ask. Shem, he is joking. I am course. joking, Shem, of course. <laughs> uh, menu, what are we talking Okay, women, are women drinking themselves to death? That's number one. Uh, which is, this is a study and this is statistics and it is that the problem is particular to women. Um, Lineker, Gary Lineker, he's in, he's in, he's in deep doo-doo again. Um, look, stay, stay, you see, Mondays with too much mark is a great way to start the week. If only Nadia thought she that. She don't live with him. Oh, darling. Um, Lineker, Gary Lineker finds himself in, in, in sort of dodgy territory again, having retweeted a tweet calling for the Israeli football team to be banned from international football. So obviously the usual suspects, namely the government and Grant Shapps and, and the Daily Telegraph are all clamoring for him to be fired. Um, is he right? Is he wrong? Or is it just refreshing to have someone, vaguely anyone apart from Nadia, in the public realm who's actually willing to say, cease fire, please. Seath fire. <gasps> Hate. Marcher. Sorry, it drives me mad. And Donald Trump is trotting out. Things are things are already hotting up, even though they're bloody freezing. They're minus 48 in Iowa, where the uh, uh, Republican caucus, caucus will be voting for their candidate uh, for the Republican candidacy in the American presidency. Now, the American election... Is going to be Lee this year. just said Nadia looks like she's in pain sometimes sitting yeah. next to Mark. Yeah, but she is. That's, thanks, Lee. <laughs> what do you mean? Tony, you are what? You told me to read the menu. <laughs> no, and you were doing very I've well. read the menu. I'm going to get coffee. You, you, <laughs> you pick it up. Okay. You doing, I've done it. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I've had enough. I'm out of it. Oh, you're exhausted. Yeah, you're like I say. You. Like I say, you know when um, a toddler just like goes completely... <laughs> Don't throw my tomatoes. <laughs> Go and get that. I'm not Gabby, even joking. Gabby, Gabby, please use that. Don't throw my tomatoes. Tell Never mind, them, Gabby. About, Go and get that tomato. Tell them about the greatest There are life. eight tomatoes and I need them for a recipe I'm doing. <clears throat> and excuse me, how many times have I... It's split. Right, okay. <laughs> Put it down. Put it down. Right. <laughs> 
Mark. Come on, so it's, pick it up. Why have you eaten the whole packet of dates again no. for a recipe? Mark, you have. Yeah. The empty bag is in the cupboard. Go to the cupboard and get the empty bag. <laughs> empty bag. That's the other thing. The empty bag goes back in the sodding cupboard. It did, Mark, because pick I got them out to, for the recipe today and the bag was empty. Good morning, everybody. Okay, so this story is um, this is this is interesting actually because we do so hard. Sorry about that racket. Because um, we often talk about alcohol um, from the perspective of men. I suppose maybe maybe we think we do, but actually it's just because obviously with Mark being in recovery. If you're new to the channel and a man, <laughs> Mark has yeah, Mark has been in a recovery for this is his twentieth year without alcohol i once did a hundred days alcohol free and i've also done dry january dry january for me was a disaster really just made me like go completely mad and drink more 100 days was phenomenal and i had incredible results in that my health and everything was so much better anxiety low mood, never had depression, but anxiety, um, all those things were much better, lost a lot of weight as a side effect. So it was undeniably brilliant for my body. There is no way that I can fudge that. It was so obvious. If I, I uh, When I did dry January, I didn't feel it. And people always say, oh my God, I've done dry January, it's made no difference. It always makes a difference to not drink, because like they say, even just having one day on, one day off, like if you do drink regularly, Always have 24 hours in between to let your body... Oh, CDC, just, just on that note, CDC, thank you. I watched the Thursday Live with Mark, found it so helpful, can't even stop silly. I'm so pleased, Sadie. If um, you if you want to sort of go to a sort of safe kind of area to chat, share this Thursday again, it might be a bit later because I'm out at an event, but um, there's uh, there's a couple of lives there called Thirsty Thursday, if you want to sort of talk about Mark talks addiction. About, yes, yeah, about, no, no, yeah. absolutely. Uh, anyway, this, and we know that alcohol does impact much, uh, much more, impacts female bodies much more. Going back to what we were talking about last week in this book mm. that Mark bought me, research on women <laughs> um, and their bodies is woefully, wo we have been woefully let down forever since the beginning of time. And I wonder if this is a bit of a this is a kind of new research, but it's kind of probably what we all, we always knew. You know, mm. if you drink for drink next to a man of a bigger size and more muscle and everything, you're going to get pissed quicker. If you get pissed quicker, what does that mean? It means that your body is not processing the alcohol. So um, there are lots of interesting things that came up in the article. The death rate is rising. Uh, for women, wet January. <laughs> yeah, I'm just dropping up a few quotes here for Alco you guys. Alcohol related. Um, our livers just don't process alcohol in the same way that 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 men's do. Mm. And and women are coming to hospital with um, liver disease, but much further on, having drunk much less. Mm. You know, you can get something called fatty liver from drinking too much alcohol and. Um, for, for, for a long, long time, doctors didn't realise that that happened through alcohol as much as it did through eating fat. Yeah. So a lot of people, uh, people that were, a bit, a, were obese, were being accused of being alcoholics and vice versa. So there's kind of a mix-up with that. You mm. could have a fatty liver. It could be like from eating a lot of fat, but it could be from you know, drink a lot of alcohol, and the two together are pretty disastrous mm. for your liver. Anyway, lots of different reasons why this has come. And this this really interested me, actually. That Shall I just women... share the statistics just quickly, yeah. just so that we you know what we're dealing with here? Um, so, yeah, the Office for National Statistics uh, has, uh, has reported these these numbers, and it says that the number of women who lost their lives in, uh, in due to due to alcoholism or alcohol related diseases has risen by 37% in uh, five years from 2,400 per year, I presume this is, to 3,300. And these are the ones recorded. These are recorded. Be a now, lot higher than that. Yeah. And then um, the number of deaths is rising substantially faster in women than men, with the latter seeing uh, only a rise of 29%, but that's still high. So you're looking at, I think, in the region of 10,000 deaths per year, which 
I'm going to be I'm going to be a bit contentious here. I don't think that's on paper that doesn't sound a lot for the complications and how dangerous and how corrosive and how difficult alcoholism is. But I'll tell you something else about alcoholism too. Alcohol kills, it's like slow motion. I've often used the analogy like slow motion, suicide in slow motion. It it takes years of it, of, of alcohol abuse to get much, to, much, much, far fewer years for a woman. Far fewer years yeah. for a woman, yeah. But I do I do genuinely believe that we I think someone just mentioned here, I just popped your quote up. Who is it? Someone who said, Have you noticed Laura Lou, really good point. Have you noticed how our parents and grandparents generation, age sixty plus, don't tend to drink in the evenings like a lot of middle aged women do mm. these days? Those raised in the nineties drink generation. And yeah. I think they, they talk about the sort of ladette culture of the nineties. My worry with these numbers is that they are going to go on a, an ever steeper trajectory because your generation, I hate to say it, is and, and younger is the generation that's that's just rocket fuel drinking. Whereas, yes, there's an increase in older people drinking, but you're right. I mean, if I think of, I, I said to my mum the other day, I said, I don't ever remember Nan or my granddad ever having a drink, ever. No, you you wouldn't. Linda Robson always says this. There was never drink in the house. No, it wasn't like just drink a thing. in the house was like um was you know just a shocking thing. <clears throat> I did grow up with drinking in the house. My mum had a glass of wine or a sherry every night. She loved yeah. her wine. Um, and like they had lots of parties and stuff. So I was around a lot of alcohol. To me, it was totally normal. To oh, I was around lots of alcohol because yeah. my mum was drinking. Everyone, my mum But was yours drinking. was chaotic and scary. Mm. Wine wasn't. Mine was just normal. Right. You know, and it's funny, isn't it, how often people that might grow up in a really chaotic, alcohol driven house yeah, well, will yeah. never touch a drop of alcohol or they go the other way. It's quite interesting. But that is that middle place where it's just totally pop the bottle, pop the bottle. And that's just so normalised, as normalised as a cup of tea and a cup of coffee, mm. that maybe that's very dangerous in in, in another way. Mm. Um, but they're talking about advertising it. A big well, some of the it, stuff in this, research, in this article, some of the reasons given are that they feel that women are much more targeted. Right. I don't know if we are I don't with know. advertising. I, I don't know. I don't know. Do you feel that? But can I? Can I? I, I don't know if I feel that. I, I I'm not aware of any alcohol adverts. I always think you're not allowed to advertise alcohol anymore. I can't think of any. Well, I, I tell you what, I do have a feeling of, and but but this is partly because I know that you know, lovely Lily loves his cocktail. I do think there is there not a sort of gin seem to have been all the rage in recent years. I, I mean, I've noticed yeah, I a real kind so. of facelift for for me. Gin was just so maybe it's not so misery. much advertising or media. Maybe it's it's Trend. brand. No, it's it's um, what's it called? Brands, you know, companies yes. are targeting women more. Yeah, fever trade. I mean, and also, I think you know what I think is really complicated things. All the pretty think, gins, the pink gins, and all the, the range of accompaniments that can go with them. Yeah. So I think fever tree is. Ironically, although Fever Tree make mixers, and all that, I think maybe Fever Tree also do their own gins, don't they? But they, they, their huge business model is, is mixers, isn't it? It's all the stuff that you put with all of the kind mm. of gins. And They've made a I, fortune, haven't they? Well, massive. They, have, stock they made a huge, they were a huge success at really diversifying the flavoursome options I must with, say, with I gin. I do like Fever Tree. There you go, you see. They managed to make gin bearable. It doesn't have all that terrible stuff in it that other ones do. But, but... Interestingly, they're saying women are much less likely to get help. Well, there's a surprise. This is interesting. I like this. I mean, how many women like will make appointments for their kids and their fellas and or their partners for dentists, doctors, everything, and then don't do anything themselves? And I'm saying literally the thing of getting to a meeting, getting getting help mm. is made so much more difficult because of having the children being the, often the person the that takes on all the childcare. Stuart um, G. Hi, Stuart. Says awesome. we only drink on a Saturday night. And that's just at home. Yeah. Wow. See, I, I rarely drink at home unless we're having a do. Aperol is definitely targeted more to women. Yes. Yes. Amla. And the big gin glasses with loads of berries and I suppose all of that sort of stuff. Sorry. Um, Sorry. No, I was just going to. Can I just throw in a thought? Oh, I don't necessarily just, think I that it's as much about advertising as in you see no, advertising. It's a part of it. No, no, no. But I tell you what, I think it is. I think it's the advertising of alcohol or the, what they're selling to you with alcohol are often. Really foo foo far far foo foo yeah. environments, Second. interiors, or tables, or Cupcakes. bars, or photos, and so it's the whole yeah. you're buying into. Because so for me, it's not the idea of a pint that kind of 
I bemoan or miss when it comes to Christmas. It's the look of a twinkly pub and it's the sound and it's the feeling and it's the ideal, isn't it, of looking through the window and it's all, oh. But I think women are really, and I hate to be sort of uh, sexist here, but I think women are really prone to being sold the lifestyle or the experience that goes I think, around I think we are more vulnerable to the experience yeah make it it's like me time you know you yes. meet up and you have that glass of prosecco and all of that sort of stuff um but I think I think also <clears throat> women are, are less likely to reach out for help with mental stress so like depression mm. or anxiety postnatal depression all these things that are, that are Easily, when I say easily, listening on podcast, I am inverted commas because, of course, mm. it just exacerbates all those things. It, an easy way out is to have a few glasses of wine and then you might be having three glasses of wine a night and then you might be having four. I mean, I definitely used to self-medicate when when the kids were little. I mean, my life has turned upside down. You know, I was 40. I was nearly 40 when I had my first baby. And I was like, what the hell? Because I had a whole lifetime of just doing whatever I want, whenever mm. I wanted. And I found it incredibly difficult to hand over my life and my body. I, I, I really did. So I self-medicated a fair bit with alcohol mm. when the kids were little. And I think if Mark, I've said this before, if Mark hadn't got sober, I would now be a proper full-on alcoholic. I'm sure of it. Because then when I went to get into menopause, I would have drunk so heavily again. And the menopause... And the increase in alcohol is a thing. It really is a thing. And it's it's really dangerous. I was listening to uh, that article I was reading the other day with the neuroscientist that I was talking about yesterday, the chocolate. And he says he has two cubes of dark chocolate every day for his brain. But he passionately believes that nobody should drink after 65. He said the brain can't take anymore. Well, apparently you've had all the alcohol you should have up until sixty-five. I was like, oh I did God. see a piece somewhere saying that the body metabolizes alcohol so bad. I mean, your mum doesn't struggle at all, does she? I mean, she grows up like a fortifizer. Um, Steph, eighties kids. This is very good. Eighties kids were put off watching Sue Ellen. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I just have a club soda. Do you remember she said, I just have a club soda? But she did set the bar for alcoholism. It was like, well, I don't know if I want to be a Sue Ellen. Do you remember Sue Ellen? Sue Ellen. Um, what was the other the question I've never asked you, um, and I want to ask you when you did the 100 days, mm. did you quite hit 100 days? Absolutely, you did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, whenever I've asked you, would you ever do it again? You've been absolutely strident and clear, no, why? Well, it's funny you should say that because I was thinking, I've been thinking over the last few days to just I might start because I tell you why I don't think I drink a lot. No, I don't think you do. And I do like to sometimes have a drink, like mm. on a you know, and when I go to on my day that I go to loose, I usually have a drink or two with the girls after the show, and it's actually really nice. But if I wanted a twelve step you, you've just provided me with your reason for not being not having to do it by by presenting in a very affable mm. manner. I don't really think I drink a lot. But no, maybe, no, no, maybe... but over the last few days I've been I've right. been having these questions for myself because I always feel better when I don't drink. And I was actually yeah. saying to myself last night, it's a thing that I go and do, but I like that anyway. I don't the alcohol doesn't really do anything for me anymore because I've drunk so much of it. And you know, at the weekend when I was I went uh, I stayed in Brighton at the weekend with my friends Kaz and Hannah and Tits that lots of you know. And um, Kaz isn't drinking at the moment. So we just had a glass of champagne. Honest to God, we didn't even need to have that. We talked till two o'clock in the morning, you know, we laughing. We just had the best time. And I said, God, why do we actually drink when we meet up? But it's because it's the habit of it. Well, okay, let me come at this from the opposite end of the bottle of wine then. I think there's so some people you, you have to have a drink with. If you with, don't drink a lot those... and you don't feel you drink a lot, what sacrifice would it be to just say, all right, I'll do it again? Do you know what? If I'm really honest, if I'm really honest, because again, I had this conversation with myself last night. Who knew we were going to be doing this today? I I don't like disappointing people. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. If I was really honest with myself, because I think people would be, because people, I mean, I don't know why, because I'm like this without alcohol. But I think oh, people I mean, oh, think you, of I thought you meant disappointing a, people as in not, not hitting the hundred. No, no, <laughs> disappoint people if I didn't drink. So you, that's peer pressure, basically. What you're saying is, is that when you go out for lunch and drinky drinky poos, people are expecting you to drink. They like you drinking and you're drinking for them. 
Well, I don't think so, because maybe I'm just conning myself when I say that. But people do tend to go, oh, you're not having a drink. And then I feel a bit bad. I'm going to be really honest with you right now. It sounds like you need to do a step one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Tim, are you I'm in the room? I'm off to rehab. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. It's curious because our live on Monday or Thursday, it whenever it was last pressure. week, was all about varying different ways in which we not con ourselves, but but try and explain to ourselves how we're managing it and why we do it. We're not doing it for this reason. We're not doing it for that. But, no, I hear what you're saying. People but, do say, oh, God, are you not having a drink? But isn't that interesting? Because I think that that's something that's gone out with the arc. But you say, when I say, oh, you know, going out, you say people won't judge you. People, but if people are still saying, oh, you're not having a drink, people feel that stuff. No, still. but not to get pissed. I don't go out with anybody anymore that says, right, we've got to get drunk. But they want to have that one glass of Why wine Why could you not on one occasion for a period of time say, no, I'm, I'm not drinking for a bit? Are you what? what, no, you what no, no, but you, what would you be worried would happen? No, nothing curious. would happen because I would carry on being chatty, being everything. But it's, it's it, I don't know, maybe that's my denial. Yeah. Because I want the drink myself. <laughs> but actually, I'm saying, I can't let anyone down. It's beer pressure. So, I bet. Anyway, imagine me not having a cocktail with Lee. <laughs> well, is there, yeah, is there that worry? I, no, no, yeah. there's no worry. No, I, no, I don't mean literally. But, but the, why do I keep saying there's no worry? This is one thing that is absolutely true and came out of our conversation with my girls' weekend. <laughs> was I think those people that you absolutely have to drink with, because there's nobody in my life that's like that. There's nobody. Try and try and really question why. Because is it that they're really toxic? Is it that actually you don't enjoy their company? You know, what are the million reasons or even one reason why you would always have to get drunk with that person? Because I think nine times out of ten, it's going to be because you actually don't really like them anymore. So you're harming your liver and everything else and your, and your wallet. For what? A huge, well, a huge part. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but I mean, a huge part. I remember vividly being in a pub called The Ship. Um, is it called The Ship? <laughs> yeah, The Ship on Wardour Street. And let me just give you the scale of my drinking and drugging problem. This was a pub in which they'd sawn the top and bottom of the doors in the toilets off because I was too frequently going in there with other people and taking drugs. So they could see over the top. So they, they'd introduced a policy because we'd come in because we were too and I remember sitting in the ship on a night where we'd taken too many drugs mm. too much drink I was taking drugs to drink more and I remember mm. sitting on a stool look and it's it, funny this, isn't it because that's is, your chosen drug was alcohol yeah that's so but, funny but, but co cocaine would, would allow, would me to allow drink you more. to drink more and, and, and it can be the other sharper. way around where yeah. somebody is like their chosen drug is coke so they'll drink more yeah. so that they can it's, it's such a ah. so you're in a pub where that knowledge is already there behind the bar about me and the people that I was bringing anyway and I remember sitting on this small stool and this was early days of and it was no comment on what on the people I'm not judging there was no there's no judgment of the people whatsoever but I remember thinking I need to take more in of something because I'm so bored yeah and I don't mean that in like oh I'm more interesting I was boring it was boring the whole thing was boring I was bored and I was literally filling myself with all sorts of exactly. stimuli I thought it's just I just think it's a really just good question to ask yourself who do I drink with who can I not drink with? Mm. no what is the question <laughs> who could I not drink with what was the question? Who? Yeah, what's it? My parent, Christian Johnson, my parents were alcoholics before, before I had fibro. I would drink rarely, but when I did, it was to a point I didn't like. Now I can't due to flares, and I prefer for it that, that way. way. It's funny, isn't it, how often, and I'm so sorry, that's a yeah. lot. That's fibromyalgia that lot. and two alcoholic parents. That is a huge burden that you've had to carry and how amazing now though through something very very difficult because fibromyalgia is no bloody joke um that you've that you've come to this place of sobriety and i'm sure that like everything will become oh. easier actually sorry I'm, I'm just just chiming in sorry laura it's that i'm the same it's a shame but i find most situations boring when i'm not drinking mm. oh sweetie you see, that kind of comment... Reduce, reduce the outings, reduce the people, reduce, reduce, reduce. I am so reduced now, and I love it. And if there's something I know I'm going to be bored at, guess what? I don't go. I stay at home. 
and it's it's lovely. Yeah, but that, that, and that, that is something say, that becomes easier as you get older. <clears throat> yes, but we do tend to say this about so many things. Mm, it's true. Why can't we hope for better? Mm. Beautiful, young, bright, smart woman. You know, she doesn't have to wait another twenty years. Mm. You know, you do just say, L Laura. Just that say re no. that really speaks to me, Laura. That that that's, yeah, that statement that's because it's a shame. Because it, and where you put it's a shame because it is a shame, and yet it's not a shame. There's no, no there's no comment on who you're with. It's it's a it's a frustration, and we'll talk about it on Thursday. It's a frustration and a worry and a fear about yourself being all sorts of things, interesting enough, feeling easy enough, wanting to be instinctive. And I mean, the other thing that alcohol, I always found the reason I go off on them like this morning in an unpredictable kind of strange way is that for me, it is when that when that sort of process happens, it drove you mad at the beginning there. The reason I allow it to kind of almost go, I can feel it in me and I just let the foot go push the pedal down to the floor is because that's the freedom that I felt alcohol allowed me to have. And I, mm. I miss the ability to kind of access something or take something or do something that, that would massage the ability to just be stupid and to get, and, high. And to get, get high, high and be silly yeah. and be surreal or whatever. Yeah. So when I feel myself going there, it's part of the reason... It kind of suits bipolar. It suits ADHD. I just let myself go and there at the risk of annoying you. you but no, no, no. But I do love that about you. I it, love that. About, I love people that plug into, and and you know sometimes with us it's just banter when I'm like, oh my god. Yeah. But sometimes it's really hard. Like it would be if somebody was pissed at nine o'clock in the morning. It's just hard because it can just come out of nowhere and it's just mm. there. Um, but what I would say is in 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 answer to what Laura and so many people feel. It is not about you. It no. is not about the other person. But it is about crafting a, a, a life that you want. And it is peer pressure. But I'm supposed to enjoy this party. But I'm supposed to. It has taken me all my life to say, I don't like parties. <laughs> I can't believe it. I went, oh, my God, I don't think I ever have. I like gatherings of a few people that I really like, but all my life I've been known as the party girl, all my life. And I don't think I was ever happy at a single goddamn party. Honest to God, I wasn't. Mm. And if I could have run a, a million miles, I would have. But what did I used to do? I used to stay and I would drink and I would drink and I would drink. And my thing would be, oh, I can drink a bottle of vodka and still walk home because I could not walk home, still be fine because I could because I'd got my tolerance up to a bottle of damn vodka. Mm. I mean, what have I done to my liver and my blood? Oh, I dread to think. You know, so start to gently craft the world that you want. You know, and there is a difference. I know there is a difference between isolating, which is avoiding all social situations so that you don't have to have to feel anxious or you don't. But, and that is clearly wrong. But it's about being brutally honest with yourself, isn't it? And say, now, come on, is this just a bit of nerves? If I push through, when I get there, I'm actually going to have a nice time because these mm. are people that I like. To, or is it, I'm going to get there, oh, fuck. I've got to see that one. Oh, and that one's going to be... Right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to lodge in tonic before I go. And if that's what you're doing, then that is really detrimental to your life and your health and everything. I've got an idea. I've got an idea before we move on. Um, we're doing these alternate... You know, me and Nadia do... Nadia does a body image chat, sort of... Uh, it's not just food, but diets and all that kind of stuff on tonight. We should be doing one tonight. I do them on Thursday. I think when we get to the fourth one of each, we should both be on each other. Yes, that would be nice. Actually. And then again, go back to if we want... If there's an appetite for it, go back to just singles again. Um, because I think there is a lot to be had from this kind of sharing and, you know, two different perspectives. I mean, I just want to quickly read Zoe I again. I wish I'd had someone like me at 60 saying, you can, you can right. not go. Yeah. You can yeah. stay in. You can. It's okay. In fact, what is good? And there is so much more of that now in the world. Mm. I mean, I'm learning all this stuff from younger people on social media, you know, self-care, self-love, looking after yourself, all this stuff. I haven't learned this from old. I haven't learned this from my generation, not one bit. Yeah. I've learned it from younger people. Honest to God, most of my generation do not talk like this to me. <laughs> Shelley Silver, that's a great question. And again, it's, it's, it's one we should do We should do an alcohol chat about. I, I haven't drunk for years, but can I ask what's your opinion about why our country drinks more than any other country? There's so much we could oh, talk about. So, with much that. so that. many ideas on that. But let's move on with the news. There will be a body image chat tonight. There will be a drinking chat, alcohol chat on Thursday. But all of this is great stuff because obviously it really... 
you know, it, it speaks to a lot of you here. So, so um, nine o'clock tonight on this channel, join me live for the body image chat. And just quickly to reiterate, this isn't about just if you've got, if you're overweight. Hmm. This is about plenty of people hate their bodies dysmorphia, that are not. It's yeah. Dysmor- yeah, I mean, I can't not use that just medical term. No. A marked way of thinking yeah. about yourself. Yeah. Okay, just moving on because we've got to we've got to move on. Um, Gary Lineker, <laughs> who thinks Gary Lineker is right or wrong? A lot of people just don't like Gary Lineker, which is one thing. Fine. Okay, part that to the side. A lot of people find him arrogant. They find him cocky. They find all these kind of things. Um, But obviously, he's been in the news a lot for kind of, it's alleged, you know, people feeling that he's overstepped the mark in his sort of opinions on political situations, international situations. He used, you know, language to describe the the situation uh, around um, the deportations, the language around deportations and immigration and asylum seeking, didn't he? He said it was likened to, uh, you know, pre-World War II German language. So he's been in the press a lot for kind of, you know, allegedly overstepping the mark. He's gone beyond what he should do as a as a as a sports pundit. No, but specifically BBC because exactly. the BBC Guided, <laughs> guidance. <laughs> the BBC mm. is supposed to be unbiased. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So why is Gary... We've seen brilliant, unbiased coverage, haven't yeah. we, over the last few months? So why is Gary Lineker in hot hot, hot water? Or... I was going to say hot potato. Hot, but so was I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where, where the hell did potatoes yeah, come whoa, from? Potatoes are suddenly in the room. <laughs> whoa, what's going on? <laughs> Gary Lineker in a fresh route after reposting a call to ban Israel from football. Um, so so who, impartiality so who you, route. So who posted it? Well, the Palestinian, the post right. included a statement from the Palestinian Football Association, <laughs> right. which called for Israel to be banned from international sporting bodies over its genocidal attacks on Palestinian life. A campaign against anti-Semitism has now accused Mr. Lineker of failing to speak out against anti-Semitism while supporting Palestinians. Um, Gary Lineker, they say, has a lot to say uh, about a lot of things, but anti-Semitism does not appear to be one of them. Um, this, this is uh, Carolinica is an Ill, ill-informed, ignorant commentator on the Middle East. It's really interesting how what well, do you from think, when guys? I post about stuff about Gaza, people will say to me, you know, inform yourself, look at the history, and I know they know nothing about what they're talking. Yeah. Go, which okay. history? Which history are you okay. talking about? Come yeah. on. Tell me what you know about the history, and of course they never reply. But there seems to be this odd idea that history isn't subjective, nor is it multiplicitous. Mm. You know, they, you can be taught in a purely kind of uh, brainwashed fashion a particular history. It happens everywhere. We have a whitewashed, literally. Whitewashed we all have our history. bias. We yeah, all have our bias our because bias. we. What is bias for me, <clears throat> if it's not manipulative, psychopathic bias, is our hearts. Our hearts and our minds, mm. and yes, our experiences will all give us bias. There is no two ways about that. But just on Gary Lineker, mm. Mark and I were having a bit of a conflab about it this morning. Uh, I think that he will be sacked for this. I don't. Because he's because it's the BBC and because it's attached to football, <laughs> whereas before mm. nothing has no. been attached to football. Like if a newsreader says something about the news, no, not that's not a good example. Um, uh, so say, um, mm, what kind of a presenter? A presenter that does a show about... Food, a food presenter, perhaps about the politics of... Yeah. Of- of a, you know, ban, I don't know, sort of like boycotting certain products from Israel. Some, something like that, because right. it's connected to what the Their face is there. Is. And I just think, but I said to Mark, it's almost like he point, wants huh? to lose the job. No, it's I, like, I, he must know that's going to get him in trouble. I, I've, I've met him a couple of times and interviewed him. I found him more than more than agreeable. Yeah. He, I, 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 think, like I think he experienced... And I like his crisps. <laughs> I I like this point, Aaron Bullimore. Free speech. People scream free speech at boycotting protesters and then turn around and try and cancel one dude for making a few comparisons. Look, this this is what I think is the situation with Gary Lineker. I think there's a real there's a real Etonite arrogance at work here as well. Gary Lineker, whether you like it or not, has a big kind of following and can talk to a lot of people and comes from a world, albeit that he became very wealthy from it, but comes from a world of football where, you know, which isn't isn't the world of the Etonite Grant Shaps and all the Rishi Sunaks oh, and all that. Look, and what, what I think we feel Gosh. at the heart, what I feel at the heart of this is actually, although weirdly, obviously Lineker is way beyond class now, 
I feel there's a bit of cultural snobbery at work here. Like a man who's into football, who is a, a football fan, isn't entitled to have these sophisticated opinions. And I think that's at work here. And I think, I think what I think is great about what Gary Lineker is doing, there is no one in the public eye who is willing to just simply call out for Palestine in a way that isn't anti-Semitic. It is critical of a government that is losing each support by the droves in Israel. We, what, we, what we're all forgetting in the West here is we're signing up to and backing a right-wing Israeli government. Forget Israel. We talk about Israel a lot, but let's forget Israel. Let's just talk about Netanyahu. Mm. So to be critical is not to be anti-Semitic. And this constant no, conflation not, it's is not, lunacy, boring and, and old news. And there's Jews all over the world begging for that to stop because actually it, it waters down the meaning of the word if you just if you use it for absolutely everything. And I, Having an opinion that opposes Netanyahu does not make you anti-Semitic. It's as simple as that. But Mark, on the point of the BBC, is it not, would that not be absolutely contractual that he can't make a political statement attached to football because that's what he's that's what he's I for? I think he's I, I think he's know. been he very doesn't. clever because he's honed in on a topic that in all of that conflab and all of that sort of hoo-ha that happened and having to be sort of impart the impartiality thing. Mm. I don't think there's probably going to be any clause. I don't think they will have accounted for the possibility of the politics filtering into the football. I don't, I don't, right. I don't, I think, who, and I think he knows oh, that he's, clear. Yeah. but I tell you something else. I, I think, I think he's pushing the envelope as far as he can. And I'm going to say something really I, sort of almost accusatory. I think too many journalists hide behind the impartiality argument of the BBC so that they don't have to grapple with really tricky, complicated <clears> topics, <throat> nor look at the truth. And I think the fact that he's not a journalist and the fact that he's even mining this little this little kind of narrow gauge of whether he can say something or not say something, I think is brilliant. I think there aren't enough people. And why why is he not perhaps talking as much about anti-Semitism as everyone would like him to be? Because everyone else is talking about that and no one in the public eye is talking about pro-Palestine. Yeah. To be honest with you. So just put, so, just put mean, him down as one voice in that I, camp. I, I, I agree with all of that. But what I'm just saying is I don't think he will get away with this one. I really don't. I don't think, because I don't of think the impartiality, I mean, he has signed a contract that says he has to be. And I think... I don't think he minds. I, I personally think he's taking this to the edge. Well, that's a different thing. He might not mind. But if you actually think about it, read the BBC and impartiality, he could lose his job. I think the BBC needs to change because we're talking about impartiality <coughs> and they've been entirely partial in their coverage. They do everything to try and keep Gary Lineker anyway, don't no, they? No, 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 but the BBC's coverage has been entirely partial. Yeah. The other day they this described a, a, a four-year-old who had been shot dead as a young lady because they didn't want to say child. I said this the other day. Go and look at it on Owen Jones' Instagram. <laughs> Or young, who has ever called a four-year-old a young lady on the news as well? A young lady. I, I genuinely, <laughs> I genuinely do think that you know. Um, I think there's. I think it's it's like. I, I think I posted something the other day. It's we are we are living amongst Pontius Pilots, washing their hands. Turning the other cheek. I always remember when I watched. Did anyone else? Today, did any, I, I always remember watching. Was it Jesus Christ Superstar? <coughs> whatever it was. I, rem I always remember watching something, and I was, remember being fascinated with Pontius Pilate. And I remember asking. Me too. I was. Yeah. And I could, was. Because there was something about him that I thought. I thought oh, he was grappling with something. Yeah. And I turned to my nan, who was not the best person to ask a question of, because she she had the most. Well, she was a racist. I loved her dearly, but she was of a generation where she. And I remember turning to my nan, saying, "Why won't he help him?" And she said, because he's a, he's a Pontius Pilate. I didn't realise it was a phrase, you're a Pontius Pilate. I said, I so, what does that mean? She said, he won't make a decision either way. I said, but that's horrible. That's weak. And she said, well, sometimes you can't make a... And I was thinking... So in this, I feel that so many journalists in our country are all Pontius Pilates. So many broadcasters, Pontius Pilates. And I think when Gary Lineker kicks through, yeah, he may well wreck his TV career. I don't, I don't know. But part of me is kind of strangely hoping that he's thinking, you know what, that this matters too much. This ma and maybe he feels it so strongly about football because that's his realm. <coughs> 
I mean, if the International Court of Justice finds that they are committing genocidal acts, if they if they find that they are, well, is everyone all right with the Eurovision well, Song Contest and them playing football against a... a well, but yeah, because it wouldn't happen with any other country. It's pure, utter. I mean, it just wouldn't, would it? You know, I mean, G- you Germany, not... Germany have said that they will support, <clears throat> they will counter whatever judgment the International Court of Justice makes they're in support challenge of Israel. The International Court yeah, of Justice. Germany have said this. And obviously, Germany are doing this because they're wanting to push back against a history that's traumatic for them, for what they did, for what their ancestors did. Their guilt. You know, the guilt, etc. And then, interestingly. My friend who's the... German said, we are made to, she said the guilt is constant. It's daily. It's talked about all the time at school. It's a real thing. It's a real, real thing, and which you can kind which you can understand, you can empathise with. And then suddenly, in, in, in response to this announcement <coughs> by Germany... What's happening the other side of the border. In response to this announcement by Germany, Namibia said, hang on a minute, uh, Germany, can you take a bit of responsibility for the genocide of 1904-08? The reason I'm saying that was, I was like, what bloody genocide of 1904? Was... I didn't know there was a genocide. It's all about what histories we're yes. taught and we're yeah. told. It's about perspective, and I've, I'll say it one more time. Not one single international leader, minister, defence minister, leader of any Western country has stopped and stood and said about the South Africans, not one. Wow, these guys have first-hand experience of of apartheid. apartheid. Hang on, we were all on board with this country once in rectifying an appalling wrong. Where's all that history gone? What does it count for? What does that experience count for? It's outrageous. We are looking at global racism. Massive globe, right like down to the description. It's like all it's all float into the top, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. The whole hootie, well, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> don't mention the hootie. <laughs> don't mention don't that. Mention that. Anyway, the um, just, then, just finally, let's um, let's have a, a moment with Donald Trump, shall we? Uh, this is uh, Donald Trump. Let's sit home. If you're sick as a dog, you say, "Darling, I've got to make it." Even if you vote and then pass away, it's worth it. Got to get out. You can't sit home. If you're sick as a dog, you say, darling, I've got to make it. Even if you vote and then pass away, it's worth it. He wanted to say <laughs> and then dropped dead and he <laughs> stopped himself. I can Why is see he saying him, this? Why is I he saying can this? see him bringing people out on stretchers to the himself. Basically, what he's saying is it's minus 48 in the wind chill in Iowa. It's bloody cold. Minus 48. It was like that in the Arctic. So, of course, the fear is, is that as Republicans come out to vote for their leader, you know, they, they might not step out. So what he's saying is even, even if you step out and, you die, and die as you leave voting. The best thing you can do for yourself and for moi and for me and for me, me, me. Oh, he's such a narcissist, me. Don a little says uh, he's such an op. And let, like, if we want another little, should we have a little, little another little moment of Don- Donald Trump heckled by a climate protester? Rallies. You've taken millions. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Thank you. That's all right. Go home to mommy. Your mommy's waiting. Go home to mommy. <laughs> So we have got an American election coming and I think we're going to have to, I think I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to dive down on this whole experience and uh, analyse the Trump. I think we have to analyse the Trump as we head into election, election era. Anyway, we've run over. So um, guys. Massively. Oh, happy birthday to Susan Selling. Let's do a happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, dear Susan Selling. Happy birthday to you. So I see you tonight at nine o'clock live uh, on this channel for um, our body image chat.